Hey guys, I want to talk to you today about something a little different. I want to talk to you about what's going on in Afghanistan and how it directly relates to your financial future. And it has a direct relationship. And guess what? Nobody's talking about this. So at least no one that I've heard. So I want to talk to you about it. I want to get you prepared for what might be an eventuality. We may be seeing, if we look at history, we may have an opportunity here to see something tremendous being forecast. And if history is an indicator, we need to do some things right now in order to get prepared for this and to be able to withstand this potential event uh, and do so in a way that preserves our uh, financial independence and economic strength. And when I say we, I'm talking about we as individuals, okay? So go ahead, like this video, hit the thumbs up, subscribe, please. If you have already, I really thank you for that. Uh, but go ahead and subscribe. We're trying to grow this. We're talking about some things that uh, I don't see a lot of other channels talking about. We're looking at the world through a financial lens, okay? So we're looking at all of these different events that you might hear about on the news, but they're not talking about it. They're not going to talk to you about what, what we're going to talk to you about uh, right now. They're not going to frame what's going on in Afghanistan in a way that pertains specifically to something that may directly affect your finances, okay? So let's get into this. Now, what I did, because I'm a bit of a history buff, okay? I love history. In fact, you might have noticed a lot of these books on my shelf. These are just on the shelf. I've got books everywhere, okay? Um, do you ever see that uh, Twilight Zone episode with Burgess Meredith? It's an old one, black and white one, where the guy was crazy about books. His name is, well, the character's name was Bemis. Time. Ah, there's time enough at last. That's what my wife calls me because I've got books everywhere. I have read thousands of books, okay, literally. And some of them happen to be here. But as you can see, one of those books is about Napoleon. Um, so I'm a big time history buff. And what I was interested in with relation to Afghanistan, I knew that they had been invaded many, many times over thousands of years. And these people that inhabit that area, which we've come to know of as, as Afghanistan, they, um, they're pretty hardy people. They have, uh, seen empires come and go. And there's a popular uh, colloquialism that goes, Afghanistan is the place where empires come to die. So let's talk about that. Is that true? If history is an indicator, it just might be. So I went back and I took a look at basically the first concrete instance of a globally recognized empire that I could find. Uh, that came into Afghanistan was the Greeks led by Alexander the Great. Now, they did that in 330. They invaded in 330 B.C., okay, before Christ, 330 B.C. Alexander ended up dying in 323 B.C., okay, so a few years after they invaded. And when he died, uh, the empire that he built broke up pretty quickly. Um, after that, we see the Mongols come in. They came in in 1220 and invaded the area that we know of, of, of as Afghanistan. And their empire dissolved in 1294. So about 70 some odd years later, from the time that they invaded Afghanistan, they were no more. Now, I know that there are other factors in this, but an invasion of Afghanistan is an expensive endeavor. So when you see empires doing that, they're spending a lot of money. They're getting a lot of uh, their soldiers are dying because, again, the people in this area, they got a lot of experience. They got generations of experience, not just fighting these invading armies, but also enduring them and, and you know, outlasting them. They've got more experience doing that than we, the United States, have experience in being a country, okay? So the Mongols, they went in and they dissolved 70 years later. 
Then the Sikh Empire, led by Ranjit Singh, they invaded in 1837, and their empire dissolved in 1849. After that, we see the British go in in 1919. That was the last time they invaded. The British actually invaded Afghanistan on multiple occasions, but the last time they did it was in 1919. Now, that's around the time that the global relationship between you know, Europe, Asia, the United States started to really come into focus. You had a lot going on in 1919. We were going as a world into the roaring 20s, where you had a lot of excess. You had a lot of irrational economic exuberance on Wall Street here in America. And it drove good times in many places throughout the world. You also saw uh, these guys, the British in um uh, Afghanistan. You would then see the rise of the Third Reich later on uh, down the road here a few years. Uh, you went through the whole World War I period and then you went through the Roaring Twenties. You went through the Great Depression uh, and then America got involved in World War II along with Britain and you know some other allies. So a lot of flux during that time. And again, we saw a situation where Britain, Britain was spending a lot of money, had a far-flung empire uh, prior to this, and was getting into a lot of conflicts, which was expensive. And so you started to see the British Empire start to uh, break apart. You started to see the UK give back territory because of a a condition for American involvement in certain conflicts. America said, you got to start, uh, you know, uh, going, reversing this empire and divesting yourself of some of these territories. So they did it for that reason. And then again, it's expensive to have all these territories. So Britain started giving away all of the, they giving them back all of the territories. Now it took, and it, it's still going on. They still have a very few. Back in uh, 1997, they gave Hong Kong back to China. Okay. So that was a great big deal. So Britain is a shadow of itself. It's no longer the uh, economic power that it once was. It's no longer the military power that it once was. Uh, and, you know, they came in there in 1919 and invaded Afghanistan for the last time. And, you know, shortly thereafter, they pretty much dissolved as an empire. Next up, was the Soviet Union. And here's another instance of uh, an invasion or a group that invaded on multiple occasions, okay? Uh, the last time that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan was in 1979. And then we all know what happened uh, in 1991. The Soviet Union broke up. Uh, all those little satellite states went they're separate ways. And again, we see in this that part of the reason why, the big reason why the Soviet Union broke up had to do with money. They couldn't afford it anymore. They got into an arms race with America. And what happens in America when you, uh, the government decides to build a nuclear bomb, they put a contract out to the defense contractors Somebody gets that contract, they employ people who get paid every single week, who then take that money and go and put it into the economy. They take their family to the movies, they buy groceries, they pay the mortgage, they buy clothes. Didn't work that way in the Soviet Union. What would happen was the Soviets would build these towns at government expense, would bring all the scientists in, and then they would pretty much take care of them. All the food, uh, they get a little stipend, they even had... Uh, Soviet nation, national run uh, vacation spots. Okay, so all this was financed through the government. The money had no velocity. Okay, it didn't move through their economy like the money moved through the American economy. And they collapsed. Okay. Now, who was the last group to invade Afghanistan? Well, it was us. It was the United States of America in 2001. We stayed for 20 years. And now, Look at the state of the economy. Look at the national debt. We owe trillions of dollars, over $30 trillion. That's an astronomical uh, figure. 
that is just basically, we're never going to be able to pay that back. Okay, this is on the burden of the taxpayer. So now you begin to ask yourself, so if history is an indicator and we see some type of uh, dissolution of the United States empire, and it is an empire, okay, what do we do to preserve our capital? What? How do we remain financially independent or how do we continue to seek financial independence? Well, there are certain things that hold their value no matter uh, what happens politically, okay? So throughout thousands and thousands of years, okay, we know that precious metals have held on to their value. Uh, we also know that real estate has pretty much held on to its value. And look, having your own business is still going to be, depending on the type of business, but most businesses are going to remain in existence even if the country that uh, those businesses are incorporated in, even if that country somehow breaks apart, people are still going to need services. They're still going to need to buy food. They're still going to need to buy financial products. They're still going to need to buy houses. You're going to realize a lot of disruption in terms of the political system or the arrangement of a government, uh, but people still are going to need services. So real estate, precious metals, your own business, those are things that will continue to truck right along, even if you realize some sort of dissolution of your country. Will the dollar hold on to its value? Well, the dollar has lost over 90% of its value uh, since the 1950s. So the dollar is not going to be something that's going to probably transfer over uh, in a situation where the United States no longer has uh, hegemony, okay? Um, and why would it? Because the, the thing that really backs the dollar is the full faith and credit of the American government to levy taxes on the citizenry. And to the extent that your empire is broken up, then you can't do that anymore, really. Not like you used to. So that would destroy faith in the dollar. The other thing, and we're going to do some uh, a longer format uh, episode about this. I've got to do some research because I have a serious question about the strength of the petrodollar in a world where we are de-emphasizing oil. Um, I just have some questions about that. It, it may be nothing. It may be something that, um, you know, we need to consider. We operate the world's reserve currency, the greenback, the dollar. Is that going to be as uh, an as efficient a method of exchange in a world where we no longer rely on this, you know, trade of oil? I don't know. Okay, I'm just putting it out there. So, at the end of the day... When you look at what's going on politically in this country, the amount of debt that we have, especially, look, you've already got certain areas of the country talking about they want to secede from their states and join other states. You've got a ton of migration from certain states to other states, especially based on taxation. We can look at this map uh, right now from uh, HowMoneyWalks.com, and you can see the red areas are where money is leaving and the green areas are where money is flowing into. And that money is going there by people, you know, getting up and leaving high taxed areas and going to uh, places where their money is treated best. So I don't want to belabor this anymore. This is just a thought that I had in terms of with this whole thing in Afghanistan, have we seen a leading indicator of the end of the American empire. And I call it an empire because it is, okay? Um, we've got territories all around the world. We've got some way down in the South Pacific. You've got Puerto Rico. It just so happens that most of the territory is contiguous. And sometimes uh, empires have not exactly looked like that, especially the British empire. But make no mistake about it, uh, anytime you are... Uh, you have a standing army and you're sending it all over the world and you're occupying places that have been in peace for the past 70 years. This is an empire, folks. Will it fall soon? 
I don't know, but I'm certainly going to behave uh, in such a way that has me cognizant of the possibility. I'm going to behave financially in that manner. All right, guys, I'll talk to you soon.